The power is immense. The journey never ending. East Africa's great migration. One of nature's most spectacular shows. It's just unbelievable and survival of numbers, you know, it's numbers that one or two of these uh, wildebeest might get taken by crocodile, but it's, it's a small sacrifice for everyone to be able to cross the river and make it across to greener pastures. But it's not just the wildebeest that make the journey. From rangers to researchers to photographers, meet the people who migrate with them and ensure these herds run into the future. We normally walk patrols day and night to make sure that this well be are, are safe. This is the Great Migration. This is Inside Africa. Africa's Serengeti Mara ecosystem, an area known to the Maasai who live here as the land of endless plains. A staggering 32,000 square kilometers of golden grasslands, sun-soaked treetops, and rich marshes fed by the mighty Mara River. It's a region that hosts one of the world's most epic shows, the Great Migration. When millions of wildebeest, zebra, gazelle, and eland travel more than 1,000 kilometers across the East African plains, making his way up from the Serengeti Migration researcher and guide, Karl Ferruf, is never far from the herds. This adventurer has logged thousands of kilometers in the bush, journeying alongside the wildebeest. You get to know them really well. It's been 12 years of being with the wildebeest and following them almost on a daily basis. So you really get to know their movement and their habits. These wildebeest that we see right here crossed the Tanzanian border a couple of days ago and they're now in the Mara Triangle. Constantly logging their movements, Karl's mission is to understand how the wildebeest move through the ecosystem. The Mara Serengeti ecosystem is the only place in the world that can sustain two million mammals that migrate through this e ecosystem. Until the 1950s, the Great Migration was virtually unknown. Widespread disease meant the herds stayed so small, grazing was sufficient, so they didn't migrate. An immunization campaign in the 1970s changed that, and the wildebeest population exploded. And then as the numbers increased through the good times, then all of a sudden, River crosses started happening in the Mara River. Now numbering in the millions, the herds must make an epic migration to get sufficient grazing. It's a journey largely driven by weather, and it begins in the southern Serengeti. There, the rich volcanic soil can support the birth of half a million wildebeest calves. The southern Serengeti is, is where the wildebeest would be the whole year. They would stay there, but unfortunately there's not enough rain there. There's double the amount of rainfall in the north, which means as soon as the southern plains dries out, the herds have to move uh, north for, for water and, and grazing. As grazing is exhausted, the herds move in a cyclical pattern to Kenya's Masai Mara and then back to the Serengeti. Wildebeest have an excellent sense of smell and run toward the smell of rain, which holds the possibility of a feast in green pastures. 
So the only way for Carl to keep up with that keen sense of smell is to be like the wildebeest, always on the move. We're on the banks of the Mara River on the Mara Triangle side, East Africa, Kenya, and we've set up our camp here on our journey following the herds. This camp setup we can break down in a few hours and if the herds are on the move we, we follow them and we, we stay up with them and everything fits into the trailer at the back there and it's uh, very condensed and mobile so we may migrate with the migration. Carl's great migration camp sets up anywhere the wildebeest decide to stop in the East African bush. This time alongside some sizable neighbors. Unfortunately, this time around, we kind of set up camp right in the grazing area of some hippo. And, you know, so we bump into them every now and again. But, you know, we live with these guys and uh, we kind of work our way around each other. This is a camp that has the least amount of impact of any accommodation option throughout the whole ecosystem. We have no generators, solar power, and it's a wonderful place that we want to encourage people to come visit because in a way that kind of funds the research that we do and, and, and hopefully that would contribute to the survival of the migration over time. It's a nomadic lifestyle that reminds him of his youth. I grew up in Kruger National Park with my family that's worked there. My dad was an archaeologist, so we used to move from archaeological site to archaeological site. I don't know how my mom kind of survived the fact that we were three boys running around and I think it then becomes part of your life. It's a way of living. My father always used to say that, you know, we're in the business of protecting things for the future. It's the forever, ever business. And uh, that's what keeps us going on a daily basis is we are trying to conserve and we're trying to protect things for future generations. We've been collecting data for 15 years now, so we probably have the biggest data set in the ecosystem that's migration related. Carl's biggest focus is space. How wildebeest move through the ecosystem and where they get blocked by fences and increased human and farm development around the parks. The purpose of this is to advise parks boards and, and conservationists on, on how to secure habitat and to prove that we really need space for the migration to continue. There are at the moment a lot of pressure coming from human populations, both on the Kenyan side and the Tanzanian side. If there's a reduction in ecosystem size, then we stand a very big chance to lose that critical mass that we need for the migration to continue.